listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have Luisa Innocenti, head of the Clean Space Office at ESA, the European Space Agency. And they have a team called the E the Orbit Team. Uh, her and Samana Aziz have been working on ways to catch and stabilize uh, tumbling satellites and clean up uh, the space around Earth. So, Luisa, how are you doing today? I'm quite fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, tell me a little bit about your project. What's, uh, what's the whole point is to what, just clean up the, the orbit space around Earth, or is there a different mission? Um, yes, uh, we are looking to different aspects uh, uh, of space debris. As I think um, some of you know, uh, we have polluted the Earth, and in the same way, in a way, we have polluted the space, and we have polluted some orbits that we use a lot like the synchronous orbit or the geo-orbit, where we have a lot of uh, debris. And now we have uh, to stop polluting uh, in the future and uh, remove the debris, the junk that we have left up there. Uh, so these okay. are two different aspects uh, in order to preserve the orbits in the future. So when you talk about debris, what kind of debris is, is it? Any of it natural, or is it all man-made, uh, broken uh, the space we talk, When we took debris, uh, we only mean man-made debris, and uh, they can have different size. They can be as small as a few millimeters, and up to entire satellites of upper stages, which are uh, still all together, so they are as big as uh, big buses connected together and uh, with a weight of uh, around 10 tons. So uh, the debris size is and the debris mass is completely different, but any debris which is bigger than we usually say a uh, few centimeters because of tre- the tremendous uh, speeds which are involved, if it hits uh, a satellite, it will make it explode. Oh, wow. All debris are dangerous. The small one and the big one. That's what I was going to ask you is how small is it before it's not dangerous, but any size is dangerous? Uh, basically, yes, it depends on where it is. So we are usually saying that uh, we do not care between uh, brackets about these uh, debris which are smaller than one millimeter, um, sorry, the one centimeter, and uh, 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 because we can protect spacecraft. But for example, one of our own spacecraft, Sentinel-3, was hit by debris uh, on the solar array, and we lost part of the power. We didn't lose the mission. We simply lost part of the uh, power on board. And this debris was only 0.7 millimeter. Oh, wow. So yeah. all debris are dangerous. Some can lead to what we call catastrophic collision meaning we definitely lose the satellite. And these are the debris from few centimeters upwards. So not only does the debris cause millions of dollars of damage and it could be years of lost time, um, if, it, if it collides with the spacecraft and it you know, blows it into fragments, now it'll create even more debris, right? Yes, exactly. That's the problem. Um, actually, the, the point is that by now, um, debris which are bigger than... 10 centimeters are constantly monitored from ground and alerts are being issued to the operator saying, be careful, you have a debris coming on your way, on your trajectory. And therefore, uh, most, uh, all the operational satellites do what we call 
collision avoidance maneuver, meaning they move away and then they come back to their initial position. So these, uh, we do not expect in the future to have a collision between an operational satellite and a debris, a big debris, let's say around uh, 10 centimeters and then bigger, because there are these collision avoidance maneuvers. The problem is for the debris, meaning the, the big satellite or upper stage, which are dead and up there, and they, we cannot move them away any longer. So if they are hit by debris, they will explode and they will uh, create a cloud of other smaller debris. And this can trigger what is called the Kessler effect, a kind of chain reaction by which at the end, some of the orbits are not operational. This is the reason why the debris experts are telling us if you want to start and clean up the junk, what you have to do is to remove the big objects, not the small one, but the big one, from the most populated orbits, because those are the ones which risk to have, uh, which have the higher risk to have an, a collision and which then would also create a bigger cloud of debris. So we need to remove the big objects, not the small ones. Well, hopefully there's a lot less of the big objects, too. So the 80-20 rule, you know, would say that yes. the big objects are the yes. worst ones. Yes, it, it is true. Uh, there are much less uh, bigger objects, so they, it should be easier. Having said that, we don't know how to capture debris. Nobody has ever done a mission like that. Uh, because a debris is, by definition, not controlled, which basically means that it is moving around and tumbling, and we do not know how to perform this capture in an automatic way also, because we, uh, we do not expect to have full visibility on ground uh, during the whole capturing phase. So we need to design uh, chasers, which are intelligent enough to uh, recognize the debris, understand how it moves, and then do the capturing and then doing the disposal of the debris. Well, which orbits does this tend to happen in, and um, how fast is the debris going? Um, the the orbit, which one of the most polluted orbit is the sun synchronous orbit around 800 kilometers. That's the orbit that we use for remote sensing and for um, weather forecasts. And that's, uh, therefore, that's the one we want to uh, clean uh, first because it's polluted and because it's a very useful orbit. So uh, this, is, and, um, this is the orbit. And when we talk about tumbling objects, it, de uh, it depends. Um, and the uh, Andesat, which was the ESA on satellite that we were observing, was spinning at the beginning five degrees per second, and then uh, uh, it was slowly uh, uh, decreasing the speed, the rotational speed. Uh, then it went up again, and we don't know exactly why, and then now it's stabilizing again around two degrees per second. But it's definitely one of the most driving parameters to design a mission, because it's like if you can imagine a robotic arm, it's like if you try to catch, extend your arm, catch an object which is moving and which is in a way big, and then your arm has to sustain the loads that the stumbling object will impose on your arm, and you don't want the arm to break. I see. So, what you mean. so the shear forces, the so the tumbling will create like tremendous shear forces as it hits, and so yes. be okay. So it's more likely that it would uh, it would glance another object and maybe tear pieces off of it and collide with it and merge. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. And that's the reason why the capturing with the robotic arm is quite complex for two reasons. One is the tumbling of the debris. So actually, what for a debris for a very big debris like the one we were studying, uh, you would need to do what we call synchronized motion, meaning that your own chaser would have to move exactly as the debris so that you would not have this relative velocity which would break the arm. So this is one. You need to do this synchronized motion, which is extremely difficult. And the other difficulty uh, in using a robotic arm is then, um, I guess that um, you have seen 
um, the object, the astronaut and the space station, whenever they try to touch an object, it will fly away. Mm. So what you have to do in a way is that you have to encircle the object because you touch it, before you touch it. Right, right. So that you, it doesn't go away. So those are the two difficulties. One, to synchronize the motion, and second, to uh, capture before grabbing, as we say. Well, how, how, okay, so the rotational speed you said is like two to five degrees a second. What about the linear, the linear speed at various orbits or about, you know, the, the weather tracking orbit? How fast is it moving linearly? Oh, uh, this is something I don't know out of my mind. Uh, usually it says several kilometers per minute, but I would need to, to check this. I'm not sure about the linear speed. Anyway, it's not a parameter which is of importance during uh, the capturing, because your own satellite would be moving at the same speed. Okay, so... Oh, so the same orbit. Oh. We're on the same orbit. Well, how would... The uh, speed on the orbit is, is linked to the altitude at which you are, and therefore we would be moving at the same speed. So why would I collide with something? If I'm, if I'm moving at, like, uh, I don't know, a thousand miles an hour in this orbit, because so is a piece parallel. of junk. You're not parallel. You are in the... You are moving very fast, but the orbits are not the same, and they have a crossing point. Oh, but the relative oh, speeds shouldn't be very great. Like, is is the biggest danger to me as I'm getting into a particular orbit, or is it once I've settled in? You know, like an object that's in that same orbit, even though it's in a slightly different orbit than me, the relative speed shouldn't be that great of a difference, right? No, it is big. Um, it is big because you are both moving very fast and you collide very fast. It's like having a crossroad in which you have a, a, a car going, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 kilometers per hour and the other one as well. And when you when you hit, if, if you are at the crossroad, the speeds are very big. Well, each it, 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 speed is big, but the relative speed between the two may, may not be very big if they're, like if I'm, you know, if I get on the highway, you know, the motorway, and again, I'm going 100 kilometers per hour, I get up to speed, now I'm going with traffic. Even if there's a lot of traffic, unless someone stops, if they hit me, the relative speed won't be a big deal. No, wait, wait. Well, the two things. Sure. For the capturing, it's not an, an issue because you are moving on the same orbit. It's like you want to capture... A, a car which is driving exactly like you. You are on two separate lanes. Right. Okay? But for the collision, the relative speed is very high. If you have, if you are going straight and then you have a crossroad and somebody is crossing at the same speed. Oh, okay. So so that's really not, we are talking about two different things. In my case, I was talking. The speeds are high for a collision. Okay. Or if two debris hit, the speeds are going to be high. Because they are not moving on the same orbit. How so how big is the capturing? Yeah, what kind of what kind of variation do you see within a given orbit? Like how how high is the given orbit, and what are some of the relative speeds you see within a within a given orbit? The the um, when we try to capture, we are going to. Uh, it depends how which means we use because uh, for the time being, I use. Uh, we talked about the robotic arm, and there is another thing which is the the net. If I want to capture with the robotic arm, I need to be as far away as three meters or five meters from the object. Mm. If I uh, capture with a net, I will be 50 kilometers away from the object. Okay. Well, what if um, what if you have a soft material that the debris can impact? And maybe it slows it down enough where it falls out of orbit. Is that a bad solution or a good one? Uh, so, first of all, I, w I would not know. So, it's a soft material which I can put in front of the object, which will not create debris. So, it's a kind of foam. There have been, there, there, were, there have been people saying, why don't we kind of spray a, fo a foam around the debris? Mm -hmm. uh, but the po there's several pros related to that. One is spraying the form, uh, form exactly on the debris, it needs to remain attached and all the rest. Otherwise you are simply creating other debris, other pieces of foam which will float around so you have created other debris. So the other problem is, there are several problems, but another problem is this. When we are talking about these big debris um, in SSO, they will fall down. 
uh, okay. or down in it, they will impact the earth. Now, there is a rule which is widely accepted worldwide that you have to uh, let a satellite fall down, not controlled, if the risk of casualty on ground is uh, smaller than 10 to the minus 4, okay? If it is bigger, you cannot let it fall down. You have to guide the object into the ocean. Okay, got it. Got it. it will, you simply throw it down and it will fall. Now, we, uh, as a rule of, of thumb, we say that an object which is bigger than one ton uh, will require a control to the entry. Right, okay. So the idea of the foam, in case, could be used for the very small debris, not for the big ones. Well, what about a, a big net and you're not trying to catch stuff? You just want stuff to Im impact the net and lose velocity so that it falls down to a lower orbit or it falls into the atmosphere and burns up for small debris. What about that? Yeah. Uh, the, we, we have studied the net and we are still considering it even for the big object. Now, again, if it is for a small object, uh, is, again, you need to... Uh, the, the, the object has to be small, otherwise you will need the control to reentry. We started the net even to capture uh, Andysat. For why? Because as I was explaining before, to a big object, uh, the capturing maneuver is extremely difficult. You need to get close, you need to synchronize the motion, you need to um, grab it in a very specific way. Well, with the net, you can stay far away, you launch the net, you, the net closes and then you you can pull it. Now, uh, there are two issues linked to that. One is how does the net open and close in microgravity? And this one we have studied and we have validated it in a parabolic flight when you have uh, several seconds of microgravity. So we right. launched net on a scale net on a small scale uh, satellite and we have seen how the net opens and closes. So we are confident that we can do this to launch a net that they open and closes. The problem that we still need to study is after you close it, as I told you, we need the control to re-entry. It, it basically means that you need to pull your big satellite into the ocean. It's like controlling a kite, and so the tether has to be always in tension. And it's also more complicated than that because you have the thruster, which are firing of your own chaser because you need to pull. And for example, the thruster should not hit the tether because otherwise you melt down your own tether. Sure. So uh, the reentry phase, when you're captured with the net, still needs to be studied. Yeah, this sounds like a really difficult problem. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is, but I'm confident that we could solve it. I mean, we've done fantastic stuff in space, yeah. and uh, I, if we give uh, money and time to the engineers, they will solve the issue. I'm not worried about that. Uh, uh, in Europe, I used to say we landed the Rosetta, uh, uh, we landed Philea on the Rosetta, so we landed a small robot, a robot on an asteroid. Right. Uh, with mission which has been uh, frozen for several years. We launch it, we froze it, and then uh, years after we walk it up and down the rest. So those are complicated missions. Going to Mars is going to be complicated, but when they are going to the moon was complicated, but uh, uh, you, you went there, so it can be done. Uh, I'm not worried about that. We can test it uh, on ground, okay. on the right? We could, in case we could do what we call the in-orbit demonstration, to have a smaller uh, test in orbit to see how it works. So that's feasible, but yeah. it requires time and money, and that's where we have a problem. How many uh, large objects are there in that particular weather monitoring orbit? Is there any estimate on them? Do we know? Uh, I de it depends what... Uh, I think that we were counting around uh, uh, hundreds of ob objects bigger than five tons. A hundred objects? Bigger than five stones, yes, something like okay. that. Okay. Do we have uh, any satellites up there with a cam or with cameras on them where we could watch this lane of traffic or watch this orbit and see it literally in real time? Or is it just such a gigantic space that it's ridiculous to even think about that? No, we, we at the moment, 
uh, we observe the object mostly from ground. And we can see them, as I told you, bigger than 10 centimeters, we can see them, we know where they are. The only thing that we are not sure about is how fast they are tumbling. This is the point we don't know. But we know where they are, and in fact, we issue the collision avoidance maneuver. Uh, we would need uh, a cameras in space to uh, uh, track or to even monitor the, the, the smaller debris. Because there is still a discussion about the expert on how many smaller debris do we have. Are we talking about millions? Mm. We don't know. This is the part in which we would need, we call it in situ observation. How did these, how did the debris occur in the first place? Just satellites broke apart over the years up there or what happened? There are three uh, major uh, things. Well, one is you simply launch your satellite and you abandon it there at the end of life. Those are the biggest debris. Those are satellites which are still intact. Mm. So this is one. Second one is um, explosions or breakups. And these are due either to batteries, which uh, get too hot and then they make the satellite explode. Like it can happen sometimes on the ground and you have to consider them when you are in space and your satellite is dead. It faces the stream temperature when it looks to the sun it's going to be very hot when it looks away from the sun it's going to be very cold so you have uh, really? very uh, yes because it's uh, we have thermal control on board the spacecraft but it works as long as it's alive when the that is dead well that's interesting so so if i have a satellite in this you know if i have a weather satellite up there what's the temperature of the sun side versus the earth side facing parts of the satellite uh, uh, it can be very from uh, as high as 150 degrees and uh, Celsius and uh, as low as uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Huh. Wow, I didn't realize the that. Very, yeah, the, because uh, because the, the space is cold unless you look at the, uh, to the satellite uh, to the sun, right. and then it's huh. too hot because you don't have the atmosphere to protect you. Wow. So, so what happens thermally? So what do you do with objects to to prevent them from like being so thermally stressed that they they crack apart? We have thermal control on board of the satellite, so we have heaters and we have the radiators in order to vent the heat. Uh, we have the uh, the insulation on board. So it depends. It depends. Uh, uh, these are the, the 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 things that we usually do, but we know how to control thermally a working satellite, those are technology which have been there forever. Uh, it depends, the design of it, designing the thermal uh, system is one of the uh, sizing, if you want, uh, point on when you do a satellite. You need to decide where you put your heater, where you put your radiators, how big they have to be and all the rest. So yeah. it's one of the inputs in the design. But it's, it's easy to be done, if you, let me say it like that. But it sounds it sounds uh, it sounds dangerous if, if any satellite tumbles because I mean for one reason thermally the thermal controls wouldn't work because they would get hot cold hot cold uh, they would be all over the place. Exactly. And, and what happens is that battery explodes and the fuel which remains in the in the tank explodes. So we have had as high as 250. There have been a like that 250 explosions of satellites in space. And they created small debris. So, as I was saying, the second source is explosion of satellites because of uh, uh, either fuel uh, or battery uh, over um, heating. And then there have been two other things which have been some uh, collision, if you want. One was the Chinese doing a test uh, and they shoot their own satellite and they created a, a cloud of debris. And the other one was a satellite, an operational satellite, which received the warning, be careful, uh, there is a debris on your trajectory. Uh, they did not perform the collision avoidance maneuver, and the operational satellite and the debris uh, collide, and they created another cloud of, of uh, debris. So okay. there are these uh, three different events. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is, is there any way for satellites to use the energy differential, the energy gradient from sun side versus non-sun side facing to do any tasks in space? Uh, 
sorry, to two B, uh, could you repeat the question? Um, you know, because there's such a heat gradient because yeah. of the sun side and the non sun side of any given object. Is there any way we can use that energy to do tasks in space or to, to control an object? Mm, not that I know of, also because again, uh, they are dead satellites. We do not talk to them any longer. We do not control them. We do not talk. They are failed. So it's like saying uh, I'm talking to a rock, which is hot and cold. But that's the situation of a satellite when it's dead. It's not operational any longer. So, I mean, while it's operational, I wonder if, um, if you could use that when, heat differential. Yeah, when it's operational, we usually uh, we try to control the, the temperature so that the, all the electronics uh, works so that we can uh, uh, operate the payload which is the intelligence part of the satellite. So we launch satellites because we need to communicate, we need to uh, to uh, uh, observe, so we have uh, the telescopes and all the rest. So we are trying, usually we are trying to control the temperature very uh, strongly so that we know that our satellite is working. Mm. Okay, interesting. Mm. The thermal stability of the satellite is fundamental. Is there an orbit that would be the easiest to practice in, you know, maybe the closest orbit possible, or does uh, it not matter how far out the orbit is? No, uh, the circular, uh, sorry, the um, grabbing in SSO, so it's in a circular orbit in Leo, it's easier than uh, going to GTO, which is even farther away. Um, in a way, we could say that if you grab an object which is lower than, um, let's say 500 kilometers, uh, it would be easier from the point of view that if something happens anyway, the debris will fall down. Mm. If we leave it, uh, if we grab something at a higher object, uh, altitude, sorry, uh, the debris will stay there because there is a rule which says that at the end of life of a satellite, you need to move out of the protected zone within 25 years. Okay. Now, an object which is failing around 500 kilometers will fall down because of um, the drag okay. in 25 years. Our object at the end is that which, uh, so SSO around uh, uh, 750, 800 kilometers can stay up there 200 years. Mm. Okay. So, if you are to fail, if you cre your cloud of debris would fall down quicker the lower the orbit. But this is in case of failure. Right, okay. We, exactly. So we were not considering this, if you want. We were designing a mission to be successful, and that's the reason why we wanted to go up there and remove uh, the big object from SSO. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So what's, uh, what's coming next for the project? Do you have a, uh, a test run with the nets or with foam happening now, or like what's happening right now with the project? No, so the phone we have disregarded because, as I told you, we are after uh, relatively big debris, and therefore we are disregarding the phone. Now, um, we are proceeding with validation of several uh, technologies like the robotic arm, like uh, uh, the net, like all the guidance navigation control system, as I told you, you need to observe the object, you need to do the image processing on board, and then you need to guide the satellite so that it moves uh, in a very precise way, so or in an automatic way. So all of this is being, so technology are being matured. Now, for what concerns the application of all of this, we will have to see. We had proposed uh, to remove uh, a big object, uh, probably we will not be in a position to do so as a first uh, mission. Uh, probably at the end uh, we will remove a smaller object. Why? Because uh, there is, and uh, to be uh, clear, uh, we have been studying this mission since uh, basically 2012. Uh, we have matured a lot, we have understood all the, the complexities, and we are maturing the technology, but we did not receive all the funding to carry out the mission. Why? Because it's always difficult to motivate people to 
remove junk. Uh, usually you do it with a tax rather than an incentive if you want. People are asking, okay, so what? They remove a piece of junk. And oh. then, uh, so, uh, the, since the very beginning it was clear that in order to motivate, uh, investment on such a mission, uh, we had to see what was, what was the, the business plan behind it. And one is to remove the dead object, but the other one is to do what is called in-orbit servicing, which basically means you go and refuel a satellite. You go and move a satellite from one uh, place to another. And in the future, maybe you go and change a fake path, you change a battery, all these kind of things, in-orbit servicing. And there are a lot of discussion about uh, market uh, possibility uh, for in-orbit service. This is the reason why industry has a preference for the robotic arm rather than the net. Because you can do in-orbit servicing only if you have a robotic arm, not if you have a net. Mm. The net is far, far away from the object. So, since a while we are more focusing on the robotic arm because of the synergy with in-orbit servicing. Lately, as is, uh, um, uh, we are starting to discuss with industry and asking their ideas about removing an object while um, uh, proving in orbit service technology. And, but we did not dictate which kind of an object needed to be moved. It could have been a smaller one for the first mission. So we are now waiting for inputs from industry, uh, which we will evaluate, and then we will try to get the funding to do such a mission. But most probably the first mission will be for a smaller object, not the big concept. Well, the weird thing, though, about the uh, the arm is that, you know, I picture it as like a hand catching a spinning baseball or something. Yes. If yes. The, but how is the robotic arm supposed to, you know, if it tries to stop the angular momentum of the debris, it's going to, like, tear the arm to pieces, I would think. Excellent. So the joints have to be big, and as I said, if the debris is big, you need to do the synchronized motion. So basically, you move at the same speed, you rotate exactly at the same uh, way as the, the, the debris, and therefore there is no relative uh, speed any longer. It is simply look, we have some simulation, as if there are... I guess I could see like an arm on a ball bearing, like a gigantic ball bearing, so it, whatever way it grabs the object, it starts to move in that direction, and then it slows itself down, but doesn't uh, turn, turn the whole object that's attached yeah. to it. Uh, yes, but our idea was to move the small, all chase, the all chase of the whole spacecraft in the same way as the target. So hmm. it's the whole chaser which moves uh, uh, at the same speed as the target, which is complicated, but okay, can be done. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you grab a smaller object, which is tumbling less, the forces are smaller, so that's the reason why it could be easier to catch a smaller object. Have you calculated the, uh, the forces that will be developed? By a spinning uh, object? Uh, we, we've done in the case of, uh, uh, and such, but I don't remember at the moment them out of my head. If you want, I can send them to, to you, uh, tomorrow by email. Yeah, that'd and, be great. Uh, sure. Yes. And in, um, when we, uh, for smaller objects, we still need to calculate it because we need to, each object as a tumbling rate and as a mass. So we need still to define which object, and then we will calculate it. So because we have a range of objects that we have, that industry is studying at the moment, which go from objects as small as under 50 kilos to one ton or, this, uh, or two tons. So, uh, and we are trying to define the tumbling rates. So we, we only have the forces in the case of MSAT. Yeah, even if you catch a tumbling object, though, the object itself might shear itself into millions of pieces, you know, just because of the... where you yeah. catch it. Yeah. Yes. It depends also where you catch it. Uh, because we don't know how our objects are uh, after 20 years in space. You're right. Right. Well, it seems like you have a pretty difficult problem on your hands, but I'm glad someone's back on your so. Yes, I agree, but uh, that's what makes it challenging. Right, that's true, yeah. Okay, well, well, very good. Well, where can listeners find out more and um, maybe connect with you or, you know, 
pitch you their crazy ideas for getting rid of space debris as they get in touch. Yes, very good. And I will send you the, the value of the courses. Okay, and the best way to find out more about this is to go to what, ESA's website? And uh, what's the name of your mission? What's it called? Oh, it's called ED Orbit. ED Orbit. Okay, gotcha. Well, very good. Well, Louisa, I appreciate you coming. It's been very interesting. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.